Vedanta in its application to Indian life. There is a word which has become very common as an appellation of our race and our religion. The word Hindu requires a little explanation in connection with what I mean by Vedantism. This word Hindu was the name that the ancient Persians used to apply to the river Sindhu. Whenever in Sanskrit there is an S, in ancient Persian it changes into H, so that Sindhu became Hindu. And you are all aware how the Greeks found it hard to pronounce H and dropped it altogether, so that we became known as Indians. Now this word Hindu as applied to the inhabitants of the other side of the Indus, whatever might have been its meaning in ancient times has lost all its force in modern times, for all the people that live on this side of the Indus no longer belong to one religion. There are the Hindus proper, the Mohammedans, the Parsis, the Christians, the Buddhists and Jans. The word Hindu in its literal sense ought to include all these, but as signifying the religion, it would not be proper to call all these Hindus. It is very hard, therefore, to find any common name for our religion, seeing that this religion is a collection, so to speak, of various religions, of various ideas, of various ceremonials and forms, all gathered together almost without a name and without a church and without an organization. The only point where, perhaps, all our sects agree is that we all believe in the scriptures, the Vedas. This perhaps is certain that no man can have a right to be called a Hindu who does not admit the supreme authority of the Vedas. All these Vedas, as you are aware, are divided into two portions, the Karma Kanda and the Janana Kanda. The Karma Kanda includes various sacrifices and ceremonials, of which the larger part has fallen into disuse in the present age. The Janana Kanda, as embodying the spiritual teachings of the Vedas known as the Upanishads and the Vedanta, has always been cited as the highest authority by all our teachers, philosophers and writers, whether dualist or qualified monist or monist. Whatever be his philosophy or sect, everyone in India has to find his authority in the Upanishads. If he cannot, his sect would be heterodox. Therefore, perhaps the one name in modern times which would designate every Hindu throughout the land would be Vedantist or Vatika, as you may put it, and in that sense I always use the words Vedantism and Vedanta. I want to make it a little clearer. For of late it has become the custom of most people to identify the word Vedanta with the Advaitic system of the Vedanta philosophy. We all know that Advaitism is only one branch of the various philosophic systems that have been founded on the Upanishads. The followers of the Vishishtadvaitic system have as much reverence for the Upanishads as the followers of the Advait and the Vishishtadvaitists claim as much authority for the Vedanta as the Advaitist. So do the dualists, so does every other sect in India. But the word Vedantist has become somewhat identified in the popular mind with the word Advaitist and perhaps with some reason, because, although we have the Vedas for our scriptures, we have Smritis and Puranas, subsequent writings to illustrate the doctrines of the Vedas, these of course have not the same weight as the Vedas. And the law is that wherever these Puranas and Smritis differ from any part of the Shruti, the Shruti must be followed and the Smriti rejected. Now in the expositions of the great Advaitic philosopher Shankara and the school founded by him, we find most of the authorities cited are from the Upanishads. Very rarely is an authority cited from the Smritis, except, perhaps, to elucidate a point which could hardly be found in the Shrutis. On the other hand, other schools take refuge more and more in the Smritis and less and less in the Shrutis and as we go to the more and more dualistic sects, we find a proportionate quantity of the Smritis quoted, which is out of all proportion to what we should expect from a Vedantist. It is, perhaps, because these gave such predominance to the Puranika authorities 
that the Advaitist came to be considered as the Vedantist par excellence, if I may say so. However it might have been, the word Vedanta must cover the whole ground of Indian religious life and being part of the Vedas, by all acceptance it is the most ancient literature that we have, for whatever might be the idea of modern scholars, the Hindus are not ready to admit that parts of the Vedas were written at one time and parts were written at another time. They of course still hold on to their belief that the Vedas as a whole were produced at the same time, rather if I may say so, that they were never produced, but that they always existed in the mind of the Lord. This is what I mean by the word Vedanta, that it covers the ground of dualism, of qualified monism and Advaitism in India. Perhaps we may even take in parts of Buddhism and of Jainism too, if they would come in for our hearts are sufficiently large. But it is they that will not come in, we are ready for upon severe analysis you will always find that the essence of Buddhism was all borrowed from the same Upanishads, even the ethics, the so-called great and wonderful ethics of Buddhism, were there word for word, in some one or other of the Upanishads, and so all the good doctrines of the Jans were there, minus their vagaries. In the Upanishads, also, we find the germs of all the subsequent development of Indian religious thought. Sometimes it has been urged without any ground whatsoever that there is no ideal of bhakti in the Upanishads. Those that have been students of the Upanishads know that that is not true at all. There is enough of bhakti in every Upanishad if you will only seek for it, but many of these ideas which are found so fully developed in later times in the Puranas and other Smritis are only in the germ in the Upanishads. The sketch, the skeleton, was there as it were. It was filled in in some of the Puranas. But there is not one full-grown Indian ideal that cannot be traced back to the same source, the Upanishads. Certain ludicrous attempts have been made by persons without much Upanishadic scholarship to trace bhakti to some foreign source, but as you know, these have all been proved to be failures, and all that you want of bhakti is there, even in the Sanghitas, not to speak of the Upanishads, it is there, worship and love and all the rest of it, only the ideals of bhakti are becoming higher and higher. In the Sanhita portions, now and then, you find traces of a religion of fear and tribulation, in the Sanhitas now and then you find a worshipper quaking before a Varuna or some other god. Now and then you will find they are very much tortured by the idea of sin, but the Upanishads have no place for the delineation of these things. There is no religion of fear in the Upanishads, it is one of love and one of knowledge. These Upanishads are our scriptures. They have been differently explained, and as I have told you already, whenever there is a difference between subsequent Puranika literature and the Vedas, the Puranas must give way. But it is at the same time true that, as a practical result, we find ourselves 90% Puranika and 10% Vedika, even if so much as that. And we all find the most contradictory usages prevailing in our midst and also religious opinions prevailing in our society which scarcely have any authority in the scriptures of the Hindus and in many cases we read in books and see with astonishment customs of the country that neither have their authority in the Vedas nor in the Smritis or Puranas, but are simply local. And yet each ignorant villager thinks that if that little local custom dies out, he will no more remain a Hindu. In his mind Vedantism and these little local customs have been indissolubly identified. In reading the scriptures it is hard for him to understand that what he is doing has not the sanction of the scriptures and that the giving up of them will not hurt him at all but on the other hand will make him a better man. Secondly, there is the other difficulty. These scriptures of ours have been very vast. We read in the Mahabhashya of Patanjali that great philological work 
that the Samaveda had 1000 branches. Where are they all? Nobody knows. So with each of the Vedas, the major portion of these books have disappeared and it is only the minor portion that remains to us. They were all taken charge of by particular families and either these families died out or were killed under foreign persecution or somehow became extinct and with them, that branch of the learning of the Vedas they took charge of became extinct also. This fact we ought to remember as it always forms the sheet anchor in the hands of those who want to preach anything new or to defend anything even against the Vedas. Wherever in India there is a discussion between local custom and the Shrutis and whenever it is pointed out that the local custom is against the scriptures, the argument that is forwarded is that it is not, that the customs existed in the branch of the Shrutis which has become extinct and so has been a recognized one. In the midst of all these varying methods of reading and commenting on our scriptures, it is very difficult indeed to find the thread that runs through all of them, for we become convinced at once that there must be some common ground underlying all these varying divisions and subdivisions. There must be harmony, a common plan, upon which all these little bits of buildings have been constructed, some basis common to this apparently hopeless mass of confusion which we call our religion. Otherwise it could not have stood so long, it could not have endured so long. Coming to our commentators again, we find another difficulty. The Advaitic commentator, whenever an Advaitic text comes, preserves it just as it is, but the same commentator, as soon as a dualistic text presents itself, tortures it if he can and brings the most queer meaning out of it. Sometimes the unborn becomes a goat, such are the wonderful changes effected. To suit the commentator, Aja the unborn is explained as Aja a she-goat. In the same way, if not in a still worse fashion, the texts are handled by the dualistic commentator. Every dualistic text is preserved, and every text that speaks of non-dualistic philosophy is tortured in any fashion he likes. This Sanskrit language is so intricate, the Sanskrit of the Vedas is so ancient, and the Sanskrit philology so perfect that any amount of discussion can be carried on for ages in regard to the meaning of one word. If a pandit takes it into his head, he can render anybody's prattle into correct Sanskrit by force of argument and quotation of texts and rules. These are the difficulties in our way of understanding the Upanishads. It was given to me to live with a man who was as ardent a dualist as ardent an Advaitist, as ardent a Bhakta, as a Jnani. And living with this man first put it into my head to understand the Upanishads and the texts of the scriptures from an independent and better basis than by blindly following the commentators, and in my opinion and in my researches, I came to the conclusion that these texts are not at all contradictory. So we need have no fear of text torturing at all. The texts are beautiful, a, eh? they are most wonderful, and they are not contradictory, but wonderfully harmonious, one idea leading up to the other. But the one fact I found is that in all the Upanishads, they begin with dualistic ideas, with worship and all that, and end with a grand flourish of Advaitic ideas. Therefore I now find in the light of this man's life that the dualist and the Advaitist need not fight each other. Each has a place and a great place in the national life. The dualist must remain, for he is as much part and parcel of the national religious life as the Advaitist. One cannot exist without the other, one is the fulfillment of the other, one is the building, the other is the top, the one the root, the other the fruit, and so on. Therefore, any attempt to torture the texts of the Upanishads appears to me very ridiculous. I begin to find out that the language is wonderful. Apart from all its merits as the greatest philosophy, apart from its wonderful merit as theology, as showing the path of salvation to mankind, 
the Upanishadic literature is the most wonderful painting of sublimity that the world has. Here comes out in full force that individuality of the human mind, that introspective, intuitive Hindu mind. We have paintings of sublimity elsewhere in all nations, but almost without exception you will find that their ideal is to grasp the sublime in the muscles. Take for instance, Milton, Dante, Homer or any of the Western poets. There are wonderfully sublime passages in them, but there it is always a grasping at infinity through the senses, the muscles, getting the ideal of infinite expansion, the infinite of space. We find the same attempts made in the Sanhita portion. You know some of those wonderful ricks where creation is described, the very heights of expression of the sublime in expansion and the infinite in space are attained. But they found out very soon that the infinite cannot be reached in that way, that even infinite space and expansion and infinite external nature could not express the ideas that were struggling to find expression in their minds and so they fell back upon other explanations. The language became new in the Upanishads, it is almost negative, it is sometimes chaotic, sometimes taking you beyond the senses, pointing out to you something which you cannot grasp, which you cannot sense and at the same time you feel certain that it is there. What passage in the world can compare with this? There the sun cannot illumine, nor the moon nor the stars, the flash of lightning cannot illumine the place, what to speak of this mortal fire? Again, where can you find a more perfect expression of the whole philosophy of the world, the gist of what the Hindus ever thought, the whole dream of human salvation, painted in language more wonderful, in figure more marvellous than this? Upon the same tree there are two birds of beautiful plumage, most friendly to each other, one eating the fruits, the other sitting there calm and silent without eating, the one on the lower branch eating sweet and bitter fruits in turn and becoming happy and unhappy, but the other one on the top, calm and majestic, he eats neither sweet nor bitter fruits, cares neither for happiness nor misery, immersed in his own glory. This is the picture of the human soul. Man is eating the sweet and bitter fruits of this life, pursuing gold, pursuing his senses, pursuing the vanities of life, hopelessly, madly careering he goes. In other places the Upanishads have compared the human soul to the charioteer and the senses to the mad horses unrestrained. Such is the career of men pursuing the vanities of life, children dreaming golden dreams only to find that they are but vain, and old men chewing the card of their past deeds, and yet not knowing how to get out of this network. This is the world. Yet in the life of every one there come golden moments, in the midst of the deepest sorrows, nay, of the deepest joys, there come moments when a part of the cloud that hides the sunlight moves away as it were, and we catch a glimpse, in spite of ourselves of something beyond a way, a way beyond the life of the senses, a way, a way beyond its vanities, its joys and its sorrows, a way, a way beyond nature or our imaginations of happiness here or hereafter, a way beyond all thirst for gold or for fame or for name or for posterity. Man stops for a moment at this glimpse and sees the other bird calm and majestic, eating neither sweet nor bitter fruits, but immersed in his own glory, self-content, self-satisfied. As the Gita says, He whose devotion is to the Atman, he who does not want anything beyond Atman, he who has become satisfied in the Atman, what work is there for him to do? Why should he drudge? Man catches a glimpse, then again he forgets and goes on eating the sweet and bitter fruits of life, perhaps after a time he catches another glimpse, and the lower bird goes nearer and nearer to the higher bird as blows after blows are received. If he be fortunate to receive hard knocks, then he comes nearer and nearer to his companion, the other bird, his life, his friend, and as he approaches him. 
he finds that the light from the higher bird is playing round his own plumage and as he comes nearer and nearer, lo! The transformation is going on. The nearer and nearer he comes, he finds himself melting away, as it were, until he has entirely disappeared. He did not really exist, it was but the reflection of the other bird who was there calm and majestic amidst the moving leaves. It was all his glory, that upper birds. He then becomes fearless, perfectly satisfied, calmly serene. In this figure, the Upanishads take you from the dualistic to the utmost Advaitic conception. Endless examples can be cited, but we have no time in this lecture to do that or to show the marvellous poetry of the Upanishads, the painting of the sublime, the grand conceptions. But one other idea I must note, that the language and the thought and everything come direct, they fall upon you like a sword blade, strong as the blows of a hammer they come. There is no mistaking their meanings. Every tone of that music is firm and produces its full effect, no gyrations, no mad words, no intricacies in which the brain is lost. No signs of degradation are there, no attempts at too much allegorizing, too much piling of adjectives after adjectives, making it more and more intricate, till the whole of the sense is lost, and the brain becomes giddy, and man does not know his way out from the maze of that literature. There was none of that yet. If it be human literature, it must be the production of a race which had not yet lost any of its national vigour, strength, strength is what the Upanishads speak to me from every page. This is the one great thing to remember. It has been the one great lesson I have been taught in my life. Strength, it says, strength, O man, be not weak. Are there no human weaknesses? Says man. There are, say the Upanishads, but will more weakness heal them? Would you try to wash dirt with dirt? Will sin cure sin, weakness cure weakness? Strength, O man, Strength, say the Upanishads, stand up and be strong. A. It is the only literature in the world where you find the word Abhi, fearless, used again and again. In no other scripture in the world is this adjective applied either to God or to man. Abhi, fearless, and in my mind rises from the past the vision of the great emperor of the West, Alexander the Great, and I see, as it were in a picture, the great monarch standing on the bank of the Indus, talking to one of our sannyasins in the forest, the old man he was talking to, perhaps naked, stark naked, sitting upon a block of stone, and the emperor, astonished at his wisdom, tempting him with gold and honour to come over to Greece. And this man smiles at his gold, and smiles at his temptations, and refuses, and then the emperor standing on his authority as an emperor, says, I will kill you if you do not come, and the man bursts into a laugh and says, You never told such a falsehood in your life, as you tell just now. Who can kill me? Me you kill, emperor of the material world. Never. For I am spirit unborn and undecaying, never was I born and never do I die, I am the infinite, the omnipresent, the omniscient, and you kill me, child that you are. That is strength, that is strength. And the more I read the Upanishads, my friends, my countrymen, the more I weep for you, for therein is the great practical application. Strength, strength for us. What we need is strength, who will give us strength? There are thousands to weaken us and of stories we have had enough. Every one of our Puranas, if you press it, gives out stories enough to fill three-fourths of the libraries of the world. Everything that can weaken us as a race, we have had for the last thousand years. It seems as if during that period the national life had this one end in view, with how to make us weaker and weaker till we have become real earthworms, crawling at the feet of every one who dares to put his foot on us. Therefore, my friends, as one of your blood, 
as one that lives and dies with you. Let me tell you that we want strength, strength, and every time strength. And the Upanishads are the great mine of strength. Therein lies strength enough to invigorate the whole world. The whole world can be vivified, made strong, energized through them. They will call with trumpet voice upon the weak, the miserable, and the downtrodden of all races, all creeds, and all sects to stand on their feet and be free. Freedom, physical freedom, mental freedom, and spiritual freedom are the watchwords of the Upanishads. A. This is the one scripture in the world, of all others, that does not talk of salvation, but of freedom. Be free from the bonds of nature, be free from weakness. And it shows to you that you have this freedom already in you. That is another peculiarity of its teachings. You are a Dvaitist, never mind, you have got to admit that by its very nature the soul is perfect, only by certain actions of the soul has it become contracted. Indeed, Ramanuj's theory of contraction and expansion is exactly what the modern evolutionists call evolution and atavism. The soul goes back, becomes contracted as it were, its powers become potential, and by good deeds and good thoughts it expands again and reveals its natural perfection. With the Advaitist the one difference is that he admits evolution in nature and not in the soul. Suppose there is a screen and there is a small hole in the screen. I am a man standing behind the screen and looking at this grand assembly. I can see only very few faces here. Suppose the whole increases, as it increases, more and more of this assembly is revealed to me, and in full when the whole has become identified with the screen, there is nothing between you and me in this case. Neither you changed nor I changed, all the change was in the screen. You were the same from first to last, only the screen changed. This is the Advaitist's position with regard to evolution, Evolution of nature and manifestation of the self within. Not that the self can by any means be made to contract. It is unchangeable, the infinite one. It was covered, as it were, with a veil, the veil of Maya, and as this Maya veil becomes thinner and thinner, the inborn, natural glory of the soul comes out and becomes more manifest. This is the one great doctrine which the world is waiting to learn from India. Whatever they may talk, however they may try to boast, they will find out day after day that no society can stand without admitting this. Do you not find how everything is being revolutionized? Do you not see how it was the custom to take for granted that everything was wicked until it proved itself good? In education, in punishing criminals, in treating lunatics, in the treatment of common diseases even, that was the old law. What is the modern law? The modern law says, the body itself is healthy, it cures diseases of its own nature. Medicine can act the best but help the storing up of the best in the body. What says it of criminals? It takes for granted that however low a criminal may be, there is still the divinity within, which does not change, and we must treat criminals accordingly. All these things are now changing, and reformatories and penitentiaries are established. So with everything, consciously or unconsciously that Indian idea of the divinity within everyone is expressing itself even in other countries. And in your books is the explanation which other nations have to accept. The treatment of one man to another will be entirely revolutionized and these old, old ideas of pointing to the weakness of mankind will have to go. They will have received their death blow within this century. Now people may stand up and criticize us. I have been criticized from one end of the world to the other as one who preaches the diabolical idea that there is no sin. Very good. The descendants of these very men will bless me as the preacher of virtue and not of sin. 
I am the teacher of virtue, not of sin. I glory in being the preacher of light and not of darkness. The second great idea which the world is waiting to receive from our Upanishads is the solidarity of this universe. The old lines of demarcation and differentiation are vanishing rapidly. Electricity and steam power are placing the different parts of the world in intercommunication with each other and, as a result, we Hindus no longer say that every country beyond our own land is peopled with demons and hobgoblins, nor do the people of Christian countries say that India is only peopled by cannibals and savages. When we go out of our country, we find the same brother man, with the same strong hand to help, with the same lips to say Godspeed, and sometimes they are better than in the country in which we are born. When they come here, they find the same brotherhood, the same cheer, the same Godspeed. Our Upanishads say that the cause of all misery is ignorance, and that is perfectly true when applied to every state of life, either social or spiritual. It is ignorance that makes us hate each other, it is through ignorance that we do not know and do not love each other. As soon as we come to know each other, love comes, must come, for are we not ones. Thus we find solidarity coming in spite of itself. Even in politics and sociology, problems that were only national twenty years ago can no more be solved on national grounds only. They are assuming huge proportions, gigantic shapes. They can only be solved when looked at in the broader light of international grounds. International organizations, international combinations, international laws are the cry of the day. That shows the solidarity. In science, every day they are coming to a similar broad view of matter. You speak of matter, the whole universe as one mass, one ocean of matter, in which you and I, the sun and the moon, and everything else are but the names of different little whirlpools and nothing more. Mentally speaking, it is one universal ocean of thought in which you and I are similar little whirlpools and as spirit it moveth not, it changeth not. It is the one unchangeable, unbroken, homogeneous Atman. The cry for morality is coming also, and that is to be found in our books. The explanation of morality, the fountain of ethics, that also the world wants, and that it will get here. What do we want in India? If foreigners want these things, we want them twenty times more. Because, in spite of the greatness of the Upanishads, in spite of our boasted ancestry of sages, compared to many other races, I must tell you that we are weak, very weak. First of all is our physical weakness. That physical weakness is the cause of at least one-third of our miseries. We are lazy, we cannot work, we cannot combine, we do not love each other, we are intensely selfish, not three of us can come together without hating each other, without being jealous of each other. That is the state in which we are, hopelessly disorganized mobs, immensely selfish, fighting each other for centuries as to whether a certain mark is to be put on our forehead this way or that way, writing volumes and volumes upon such momentous questions as to whether the look of a man spoils my food or not. This we have been doing for the past few centuries. We cannot expect anything high from a race whose whole brain energy has been occupied in such wonderfully beautiful problems and researches. And are we not ashamed of ourselves? A. Sometimes we are, but though we think these things frivolous, we cannot give them up. We speak of many things parrot-like, but never do them, Speaking and not doing has become a habit with us. What is the cause of that? Physical weakness. This sort of weak brain is not able to do anything. We must strengthen it. First of all, our young men must be strong. Religion will come afterwards. Be strong, my young friends, that is my advice to you. 
you will be nearer to heaven through football than through the study of the Gita. These are bold words, but I have to say them, for I love you. I know where the shoe pinches. I have gained a little experience. You will understand the Gita better with your biceps, your muscles, a little stronger. You will understand the mighty genius and the mighty strength of Krishna better with a little of strong blood in you. You will understand the Upanishads better and the glory of the Atman when your body stands firm upon your feet and you feel yourselves as men. Thus we have to apply these to our needs. People get disgusted many times at my preaching Advaitism. I do not mean to preach Advaitism or Dvaitism or any ISM in the world. The only ISM that we require now is this wonderful idea of the soul, its eternal might, its eternal strength, its eternal purity, and its eternal perfection. If I had a child, I would from its very birth begin to tell it, Thou art the pure one. You have read in one of the Puranas that beautiful story of Queen Madalasa. How as soon as she has a child she puts her baby with her own hands in the cradle, and how as the cradle rocks to and fro, she begins to sing, Thou art the pure one, the stainless, the sinless, the mighty one, the great one. A. There is much in that. Feel that you are great and you become great. What did I get as my experience all over the world is the question. They may talk about sinners, and if all Englishmen really believed that they were sinners, Englishmen would be no better than the Negroes in Central Africa. God bless them that they do not believe it. On the other hand, the Englishman believes he is born the Lord of the world. He believes he is great and can do anything in the world. If he wants to go to the sun or the moon, he believes he can, and that makes him great. If he had believed his priests that he was a poor miserable sinner, going to be barbecued through all eternity, he would not be the same Englishman that he is today. So I find in every nation that, in spite of priests and superstition, the divine within lives and asserts itself. We have lost faith. Would you believe me? We have less faith than the Englishman and woman a thousand times less faith. These are plain words, but I say these, I cannot help it. Don't you see how Englishmen and women, when they catch our ideals, become mad as it were, and although they are the ruling class, they come to India to preach our own religion notwithstanding the jeers and ridicule of their own countrymen? How many of you could do that, and why cannot you do that? Do you not know it? You know more than they do, you are more wise than is good for you, that is your difficulty. Simply because your blood is only like water, your brain is sloughing, your body is weak. You must change the body. Physical weakness is the cause and nothing else. You have talked of reforms, of ideals and all these things for the past hundred years, but when it comes to practice, you are not to be found anywhere till you have disgusted the whole world, and the very name of reform is a thing of ridicule. And what is the cause? Do you not know? You know too well. The only cause is that you are weak, 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 your body is weak, your mind is weak, you have no faith in yourselves. Centuries and centuries, a thousand years of crushing tyranny of castes and kings and foreigners and your own people have taken out all your strength, my brethren. Your backbone is broken, you are like downtrodden worms. Who will give you strength? Let me tell you, strength, strength is what we want. And the first step in getting strength is to uphold the Upanishads and believe I am the soul, me the sword cannot cut, nor weapons pierce, me the fire cannot burn, me the air cannot dry, I am the omnipotent, I am the omniscient. So repeat these blessed, saving words. Do not say we are weak, we can do anything and everything. What can we not do? 
Everything can be done by us, we all have the same glorious soul, let us believe in it. Have faith, as Nachiketa. At the time of his father's sacrifice, faith came unto Nachiketa, a. I wish that faith would come to each of you, and every one of you would stand up a giant, a world mover with a gigantic intellect, an infinite God in every respect. That is what I want you to become. This is the strength that you get from the Upanishads, this is the faith that you get from there. A. But it was only for the sannyasin. Rehesya Esoteric The Upanishads were in the hands of the sannyasin, he went into the forest. Shankara was a little kind and said even Grihasthas, householders, may study the Upanishads, it will do them good, it will not hurt them. But still the idea is that the Upanishads talked only of the forest life of the recluse. As I told you the other day, the only commentary, the authoritative commentary on the Vedas, has been made once and for all by him who inspired the Vedas by Krishna in the Gita. It is there for everyone in every occupation of life. These conceptions of the Vedanta must come out, must remain not only in the forest, not only in the cave, but they must come out to work at the bar and the bench, in the pulpit and in the cottage of the poor man, with the fishermen that are catching fish and with the students that are studying. They call to every man, woman, and child whatever be their occupation, wherever they may be, and what is there to fear. How can the fishermen and all these carry out the ideals of the Upanishads? The way has been shown. It is infinite, religion is infinite, none can go beyond it, and whatever you do sincerely is good for you. Even the least thing well done brings marvelous results. Therefore let everyone do what little he can. If the fisherman thinks that he is the spirit, he will be a better fisherman. If the student thinks he is the spirit, he will be a better student. If the lawyer thinks that he is the spirit, he will be a better lawyer, and so on, and the result will be that the castes will remain forever. It is in the nature of society to form itself into groups, and what will go will be these privileges. Caste is a natural order. I can perform one duty in social life, and you another, you can govern a country, and I can mend a pair of old shoes, but that is no reason why you are greater than I, for can you mend my shoes? Can I govern the country? I am clever in mending shoes, you are clever in reading Vedas, but that is no reason why you should trample on my head. Why if one commits murder should he be praised? And if another steals an apple, why should he be hanged? This will have to go. Caste is good. That is the only natural way of solving life. Men must form themselves into groups, and you cannot get rid of that. Wherever you go, there will be caste. But that does not mean that there should be these privileges. They should be knocked on the head. If you teach Vedanta to the fisherman, he will say, I am as good a man as you, I am a fisherman, you are a philosopher, but I have the same God in me as you have in you. And that is what we want, no privilege for anyone, equal chances for all, let everyone be taught that the divine is within, and everyone will work out his own salvation. Liberty is the first condition of growth. It is wrong. A thousand times wrong, if any of you dares to say, I will work out the salvation of this woman or child. I am asked again and again, what I think of the widow problem and what I think of the woman question. Let me answer once for all, am I a widow that you ask me that nonsense? Am I a woman that you ask me that question again and again? Who are you to solve women's problems? Are you the Lord God that you should rule over every widow and every woman? Hands off! They will solve their own problems. O oh, tyrants, attempting to think that you can do anything for anyone. Hands off! The Divine will look after all.
Who are you to assume that you know everything? How dare you think, O blasphemers, that you have the right over God? For don't you know that every soul is the soul of God? Mind your own karma, a load of karma is there in you to work out. Your nation may put you upon a pedestal, your society may cheer you up to the skies, and fools may praise you, but he sleeps not, and retribution will be sure to follow, here or hereafter. Look upon every man, woman, and every one as God. You cannot help anyone, you can only serve. Serve the children of the Lord, serve the Lord Himself, if you have the privilege. If the Lord grants that you can help any one of His children, blessed you are, do not think too much of yourselves. Blessed you are that that privilege was given to you when others had it not. Do it only as a worship. I should see God in the poor, and it is for my salvation that I go and worship them. The poor and the miserable are for our salvation, so that we may serve the Lord, coming in the shape of the diseased, coming in the shape of the lunatic, the leper, and the sinner. Bold are my words, and let me repeat that it is the greatest privilege in our life that we are allowed to serve the Lord in all these shapes. Give up the idea that by ruling over others you can do any good to them. But you can do just as much as you can in the case of the plant, you can supply the growing seed with the materials for the making up of its body, bringing to it the earth, the water, the air, that it wants. It will take all that it wants by its own nature. It will assimilate and grow by its own nature. Bring all light into the world. Light, bring light. Let light come unto everyone, the task will not be finished till everyone has reached the Lord. Bring light to the poor and bring more light to the rich, for they require it more than the poor. Bring light to the ignorant and more light to the educated, for the vanities of the education of our time are tremendous. Thus bring light to all and leave the rest unto the Lord, for in the words of the same Lord to work you have the right and not to the fruits thereof. Let not your work produce results for you and at the same time may you never be without work. May he who taught such grand ideas to our forefathers ages ago help us to get strength to carry into practice his commands.